Hey Hayden, awesome job on the video. People loved it. In fact, I was wondering, do you want to make another one? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'd be happy to show people a little bit more on the process side. That's something that's been uh, super necessary for, for anyone who owns a business. What we're going to cover today is not just an SOP, right? Which is just a single standard operating procedure, but a whole sort of system systematized framework for creating SOPs. With that SOPs, knowledge really just lives in people's heads. You know, you call it tribal knowledge and your team really can't scale. With SOPs, it acts as an awesome sort of onboarding and training tool. If you get sick, you know, you're away for a week or you take a vacation for a week, the SOPs exist. Anyone else can really take over. So I would say you should make SOPs for anything that is re a repeated process and especially anything that will be done by more than one person. I think of SOP is several levels. Level one explains everything that happens from start to finish. And it might be over the course, in our case, of months. The level two explains kind of one piece of it that might involve one department, right? And maybe a, a few people. And then the level three, which is a guide, is going to be, you know, a very specific part that's for one person, typically. And it's, it's the most tactical and the least strategic. I have a company, Acquira. It helps people buy businesses. And we have a product um, called Accelerator Plus that does a lot of the work um, for actually identifying um, businesses for sale. Core process here might be, as an example, um, your delivery to success, the actual fulfillment of whatever product or service you're doing. And so each product or service would have a different delivery to success core process. And in this video, I'm going to highlight a delivery to success core process. So I thought it might be interesting to actually show what it looked like pre-AI um, and now what it looks like post-AI. And this is what it kind of looks like pre-AI. So this is Excalibur. It's just, you know, kind of like Miro, but cheaper. Originally, it was a whiteboard. I did this with a director in Toronto and we had a big whiteboard and we put post-it notes on it. And we just identified the process from start to finish sequentially. And that probably took a full day. And then once we really figured it out, we then put it in manually into Excalibur. And we played with it in such a way that it would be a little bit easier to identify. I'll go through very quickly. Basically, you know, we receive money, we onboard, um, we have a call with the AE, the customer, the acquisition entrepreneur. We have an internal search uh, kickoff call, and then we onboard into two different paths. One path is on market, meaning these are this is like a marketplace of brokered listings that you can peruse. And then we have off market at the same time, which is basically businesses that are not listed for sale. And you're going to reach out to and see if they want to sell throughout this all that we don't need to go into, you know, too much detail. But basically, there's like this path that involves a couple different roles in the company, right? Another path that involves a couple different roles, there's some um, overlap here. And each of these things, each of them has a link and that link goes to the actual SOP. The beauty of this, you could almost think of this as like the core process in the sense that at any point you could take, I could explain to you who doesn't really know anything about the business exactly sequentially what we do on behalf of the customer. This probably took, I'd say six months, like a good six months to do. And then it was still quite a bit of improvement that happened over time. That's the old way to do it. When AI first had the ability to become multimodal and allow you to screenshot, I was playing with that ability and trying to understand, you know, what AI was capable of. And I actually screenshotted that that diagram that I showed, the Excalibur diagram. I basically just said, what is this? And I was blown away that AI had a pretty decent understanding of what it was. That to me was like, was the Eureka moment. I just spent a couple hours at least every day kind of tinkering testing AI's capabilities. A perfect example of how do I how do I work with AI? This was basically I was preparing for this video. I have my master prompt in, so just so everyone knows, this is a, a pretty simple master prompt for Aquara. It's got, you know, not too many files in it. In the in a project, so it's taking my style preferences and it's putting that, it's just, it's injecting that into every single prompt I say. Um, it's also taking everything within here. Right. And so this is sort of like the business identity. And this was a lot of the stuff was covered in the master prompt doc. Um, so this understands like my unique value proposition, my brand voice. Um, I have sort of the company mission, our core values. All I did is I this was the prompt. Right. So create a visual diagram for the core process of sale to delivery and to delivery success for the Accelerator Plus deal search product. 
it knows what Accelerate Plus is because of the project files. I'm just saying it begins after the sale has been made and an invoice has been sent. It ends when an LOI is signed and we've been paid for phase two. So I just say clear, clear beginning, like scope, beginning and end. Because of my master prompt, it always basically asks me questions one at a time um, and, and tries to answer it based on its own knowledge. It's answering its own question. It's talking like when the handoffs happen, what the activities are, what the success criteria is, et cetera. And it asked me if that's right. And so I basically add something in here, right? I said, there's non-market team. It has a couple more questions. It has a very interesting question. It's interesting that it gets this so fast. So his question here is like, what happens when you find multiple deals um, that could match multiple AEs? How do you prioritize assignment, right? It, it identified that within a few seconds, which is interesting because it's, it's something that we spent a lot of time thinking over. And basically I answered it here. It created it right here. And what I ended up doing, just, just so we look at this, you know, the, the final version, is I, I then asked it to add RACI. Um, so RACI is, is kind of, it's process speak. It's, it's R-A-C-I, right? And it stands for who's responsible, who's accountable, who's consulted, and who's informed. And it's very useful for process because it, it shows uh, very clear ownership. So responsible would be the party that's actually doing the work. It could be multiple people responsible if, if people are working together or in parallel. Most of the time, it's one person. And best practice would be one person. Accountable is usually that person's boss. And it literally means they're the one that like counts the KPI for success. And so that's accountable. It should always be only one person. If there's two people accountable, nobody's accountable. Consulted is who does the responsible party typically need to have a conversation with to get this done? And so that means like it's a two-way street. Right? I'm going to talk to them and I need their input as well. And informed is who just needs to be informed, one way conversation, who needs to be informed that this happened. That's it. So for each task, we have a responsible and accountable consulted and informed. So this would be, again, the, the core process. It starts with an onboarding call. It knows who's responsible. This is all correct. The KPIs are correct. I didn't have to correct it. We, it talks about the investment thesis development. So if we, again, if we comp compare this, you know, we have this and then we have the same investment thesis, which is actually part of this process here. It then activates a parallel track, which is these two things. Again, I did not share at all this image or uh, Excalibur with AI. It just knows on the master prompt and common sense. And it basically says, okay, we have two tracks on market and off market. It walks through each step, A1, A2, right? A3, A4, a decision point. Again, RACI and KPIs for each. And then it shows where the tracks converge and what happens for each. Um, and then it came at, with this sort of key performance metrics, key roles and responsibilities at the end. And this is just an HTML artifact. And it basically represents this entire thing. The next part after this, I basically said, okay, create a guide for the onboarding call, right? So that's basically this one right here in a separate artifact. Again, normally in an onboarding call or an SOP, you just, I would interview the person who's already doing it. And I would just basically have them walk me through it. We could screen record a call and it could, uh, based on the recording, I might ask it to, I might ask Claude to make an SOP. And, and that would be a version of it that would take two people, maybe 30 minutes. The problem with that, you're gonna get what you're currently doing and you may not get what you should be doing. So this, I, I try to do both. Right. So one is what are we currently doing and what is, you know, what, what should we do that basically created this. And again, all I said here is create a guide for the onboarding call in a separate artifact, make it appropriate for a company of acquirer size. It knows who owns it basically knows what tools we need to use, does the step-by-step -step process, the email. So I would then review this with Nathan, who, who is the one, the responsible party here. Uh, and we would look at, you know, is there anything in here? that we're not currently doing, which I'm sure there is. Is this the SOP we want to use or do we want to go with something simpler? And we can just keep on going. I can show you how long it actually takes. So if we go back to this process, so that was the first SOP. And if we say create a guide for investment thesis. Here's, I'm just doing this live now. Uh, create a guide for investment thesis development, a separate artifact. Okay, so this is done took about maybe three or four minutes. I think it created a, probably too much detail, 
Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at it. And so I'll show you what happens when, when that usually happens. And, and by the way, I have prompt in here that tells AI how I like to see process made. And this is something that we can share. So it's actually part of, it's part of my style preferences. I have this one. So I, we can share this with people. They can get this and put this into their master prompt as a like a protocol for creating process and teaching AI like the language of process. But my first thing is uh, I'd like you to be concise with your wording and to always ask me clarifying questions when I ask for something and to answer your own question based on your knowledge, then wait for my confirmation before proceeding. This is so important. At first, I was just asking people ask, asking it to ask me questions one at a time, right? Because if it asks you eight questions and it overwhelms you with text, then you, you end up missing them. And then I realized, what if AI already knows the answers? And so when I asked to, to do, then do this, to answer it based on your knowledge and wait for my confirmation, I realized that 95% of the time it got it completely right. Uh, and then the other benefit of that is you see where there are holes or gaps in the AI's knowledge, and you can then clarify and add to your master prompt or edit your, your master prompt to address those gaps. One thing that you could add to this, and actually I have that as my style preferences in ChatGPT, is to also score your own answer, the answer you have based on your knowledge, based on your confidence um, out of 10. And that way you can have an understanding of like, when chat when chat gpt might be hallucinating or making sort of vague assumptions because it'll say like you know my confidence is five out of ten when i ask for advice for you to be a thought partner i want you to be skeptical and conservative in your estimates not every idea is a good one i want you to challenge when it makes sense so this is sort of the you know anti-sycophant statement in my business businesses i'm always looking to become a category of one i'm always looking to sell high ticket products and services the wealthy in the early stages of a business i always want to have an eight percent gross margin when comparing two or more options list the pros and cons of each then ask me if i want you to create a hybrid approach taking advantage of the pros and mitigating the cons all of these i encounter you know multiple times a day these are like my top four like little snippets to just making ai a better thought partner there's another couple of things here and, and we'll share this. So things like KPIs and process have different definitions and different understandings based on different frameworks. It's important to tell Claude or ChatGPT or which, whichever LLM, it's important to tell it what language we want to use and to speak the same language. In my case, I have sort of my own framework for process, which is that that process, there's this, you know, mutually exclusive, cumulatively exhaustive way of looking at process in which we have sort of three different types of pro process. We have sort of the strategic planning or business identity. We have the core processes of a business, which is you know that loop we've talked about in previous videos. And then we have enabling processes. And so I just explain what these are in, to AI so that it understands the way I look at process. So it knows the core processes are market to lead, lead to sale, sale to delivery, delivery to success, success to lead, success to market. And it also understands some of the pieces within them. Um, it also understands what the enabling processes are, and it understands what a lot of the strategic planning processes are. So that's one piece. And then the other piece that I keep in here for that's process related is this one. So functionally understanding SOP levels. So I basically define what is a core process. And I also define what is a blueprint, right? Which is a full breakdown of a, of a repeatable business function. And then I also talk about, and like what, when you create an SOP, what should be in the SOP of a blueprint, right? Objective, scope, triggers, et cetera. Um, and then what is a guide? And so all of this will include, but then you can put it in your project um, or in your system preferences. And now you know, it will make SOPs the right way. So this is the investment, investment thesis development guide. Again, it's following the instructions that are in those system preferences. So what's the trigger? What's the prerequisite? What does it apply to? What are the required tools? What's the step-by-step -step process? Quality standards. So this is very long, this piece of it. So it's using investment thesis in a much more exhaustive way than we actually do in, within our business. So for example, it's trying to understand like the holding period and the exit strategy for the AE, which is probably unnecessary. Um, so I, I could go back and, and tell it, or I would go back and say, you know, we don't need section F. We can remove that. I'd say we don't need section F. One little hack, which I can, we, we can go over a little bit, is you can create a little custom app to house everything. What I originally did 
was I actually just had Claude help me make like a Notion template, but I think it's even faster if you just have it create like a React app. React is is basically just uh, it's a, it's Claude's prefer preferred way of creating little web apps. So it's just a it's a programming stack. You could just make it in, in HTML, which would be a little bit less efficient. What I imagine it will create is it'll create, it should, or what I'm looking for it to create, is for it to create basically this page, except I can click here. And when I click here, I then get you know, this SOP. And so what I can do from there is I can take and copy that code and I can put it into another platform like V0 um, or like Manus. And I can just basically say, recreate this app and host it for me. And Claude doesn't really do that well for you right now. It's not really appropriate to do it in Claude. And from there, I can now I now have basically an app I can share with my team. Again, this is now becoming a lot more sophisticated, but it's a, it's a way to share the project in a way that's much more user friendly. Um, and exists outside of Claude. Whoever's watching knows how to code. You know, they can just host it on like Netlify or something, and that's fine. But I'm just trying to be mindful of people who may not know how to code. I'm seeing right here, nothing's happening here, right? Which sometimes you see. I'm just gonna screenshot it. I'm gonna say it doesn't work. Yeah, so it knows what's wrong. It sees, okay, you just see a blank, a blank purple gradient screen. If you don't screenshot it and you say it doesn't work, you're not really giving it any context, and you have to understand that it doesn't see you know, your screen. So this is the first draft to give you an idea of how it could look. And so you could imagine in this chat, I might go and say, hey, create it for active listing monitoring, right? And then once we get it, we could copy and add it to here. Again, this was just, I was just prototyping it here. You don't necessarily do that here. I, I could bring it to these other tools, Replit, V0, Lovable, Manus, and I could literally just give it the code right? Put it in and say, you know, I want this to be hosted. I want this to have a database, all that other stuff. Um, and you could turn it into a real app. You know, I, I would say I'm, I'm probably top 1% in like AI experimentation. And I am still am amazed constantly at how much business is going to change. The more I look at this, the more I see, you know, business really is just going to be a co-pilot to do everything. And there's going to be a certain amount of work that it takes to set that co-pilot up. I think businesses can do it today. And I think all businesses will be doing it in five years. There's a window of time and opportunity um, to, I would say, extract a lot of value, getting that done quicker.